Okay, welcome everybody to our May Book Club. Um, and we are so, so honored and happy to have Diane Wilson join us. This is just super fun um, to be able to hear the author's point of view, her inspiration, her history. Um, so that said, let's start um, with James and Diane are going to talk a little about, about the book. And because there are so many of us, why don't we ask to start with that you put a uh, your question in the chat, and then we'll try to get to them in order. And um, we'll just um, unmute when it's time for you to ask your question, um, just so we don't have a whole bunch of background noise and aren't talking over each other. And and uh, we'll start out like that. And eventually you might end up in a free for all where everybody's talking over each other. But um, let's, let's start out um, trying to do this in an organized fashion. So um, James and Diane, please. Yep. Okay, good. Oh, I, you know, I thought that was, I thought Hannah was going to start barking them just as you said my name, and I thought that would have been perfect, but she didn't do it. Uh, I'm sure she'll bark at some other inappropriate time. Thank you, Diane, so much for joining us. I, I loved your book. I just think it's, it's so wise and moving, and, and I love the, the four voices you created are so powerful, and each of them is so individualized and you know, the way that, that each voice, you know, tells their story in such a, such a strongly personal way, but yet it's always linked. And then the secondary characters like the father are so clear. Uh, I just think it's a, it's a really wonderful book and it's got a lot of powerful political stuff in it as well. So that's, that's hard to bring all of that together. And so I, I'd love for you to, to start um, by maybe sharing with us some of your own family story and just just sort of the arc of how you got to this book from you know from everything that happened that that you know sort of prompted it, if that's okay. Yeah. If that's a good. Uh, well, I want to say hello to everybody tonight and thank you for the invitation to spend some time with you. Um, I think we've got rain on the way, which is really wonderful for all you gardeners out there. Um, I just, I looked up where Spring Green is and you're about four hours from where I live. I'm right on the border of um, St. Croix River and Osceola. So um, I'm a neighbor to Wisconsin. So someday if I'm traveling that way, I'm gonna check out this bookstore because I, I love finding a, a, a great new bookstore. Um, but I really appreciate you you uh, selecting this book and, and reading it, and I'm really excited to hear your questions. You know, as writers, we labor in silence and solitude for many years with no idea what people are going to think once you put it out there. So, so this is a great opportunity just to have a conversation with all of you. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, I grew up in Minneapolis in Minnesota, and... Uh, I've got four siblings, and when I was growing up, um, what I knew about my mother was that she was Lakota. She'd grown up in South Dakota. She spent six years at the Holy Rosary Mission School on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and um, and she didn't like talking about it. So we didn't we we didn't have much of a connection to our native community. And my dad was Swedish, so it was um, definitely a, a mixed growing up. But it was something that I then began to explore when I got older, um, it, it just out of curiosity about my mother's life and her experience in boarding schools and, and how her life was so different from mine. So I wrote a memoir called Spirit Car, Journey to a Dakota Past. And that really looks at, um, I trace my mother's family back to the 1862 Dakota War in Minnesota. And then I just, um, I showed, I, I, my hope was to show through my family's story how assimilation works and how the legacy of your family's history just rolls forward with each generation um, until it comes to your own life. So um, that was, that was actually a deep education for me in the way that assimilation policies have worked in this country, especially boarding schools. Um, since my mother and my four aunts all um, attended boarding schools in South Dakota. So um, 
about that same time that I was working on that book, I heard about these, I was also a gardener. So I was a wannabe writer and I was a gardener and I wanted to, um, and I was trying to figure out how to write that story. I heard about these very old, rare indigenous seeds that were being grown out down in Farmington, Minnesota on this little garden. And I heard that they had um, corn that had been originally carried on the Cherokee Trail of Tears. And there was 800 year old tobacco. There were, were Hopi black tur turtle beans. And, you know, it just, it, as soon as I heard about those seeds, I knew that I needed to go there and just volunteer and be part of that work. And what I didn't realize was that that work then would really become a very big part of my life going forward. And that the two, the two interests, the writing and the gardening, um, the seed work would become intertwined so that um, I became a volunteer there for a number of years and then I became the director. <laughs> I mean, it was a little longer path, but I was the director for this organization, Dream of Wild Health, for about 11 years. Um, and during this time, I was writing my memoir that was published in 2006. And then I published um, a second book that was all about trying to figure out how we, how we recover and do the healing work of historical trauma. So looking at um, experiences like boarding schools, what do we do with that? How do we make this, how do we transform this into a better way of life for our children? And one of those ways I discovered was through gardening. It was through these seeds that we were growing out at Dream of Wild Health. So during those 11 years, I got to work with elders who taught me so much about um, uh, the, a different kind of relationship with seeds where gardening is considered to be, um, it's, a very, it's a very sacred process because you're dealing with plants, you're dealing with uh, new life, you're dealing with um, the earth itself and to come to that work with a, from a place of reverence. And then just to see the way that returning to these beautiful old foods just, just had such an impact on the kids in the programs and the families we worked with. So during that time, I'm just absorbing all of it. All of this is just going into my, um, my imagination. And at some point, um, I also heard that story about the Dakota women who hid the seeds in the hems of their skirts and in their pockets um, when they were about to be removed after the 1862 Dakota War. And so that was a true story that then became kind of the kernel right at the heart of the book. And then I just started forming pieces around it. So, um, so the Seed Keeper for me is far more than a book. It's the culmination of um, years of, of learning both my culture and the gardening and, and also how to write because those first two books really helped give me the skills to understand, um, well, to give me, you know, some idea how to go, go about writing a novel, which turned out to be just a huge challenge. <laughs> They're all huge challenges, but this was a whole new huge challenge. So that's how I got to write the three books that I did. It's all been part of my life journey. Um, yeah, and, it, it, and it, your journey is so unlike, you know, many of us that, that that's partly, I think, makes the, the book so, so unusual. Um, so, what were the things in your own family story that that really? I can't believe you know, when you traced your family back to the actual Dakota War. That's amazing. Um, but you, and then when you, so you, you got to this. You were on a march, right? When yeah. you heard that the story. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So talk a little about that. So the. Um, it, it was, it's funny because they, uh, this was all happening around the same time, learning about the seeds. And then 2002, I heard about um, the Dakota Commemorative March, which, you know, I don't know how much uh, Minnesota history that, that you all know, but 
1862 Dakota War was a very big event, um, especially for Dakota people, because after this war, um, the Dakota were removed from the state and sent to a, a reservation in South Dakota. Um, and then over the years, many people found their way back um, and settled kind of in the same area. So the march that I got involved with was to actually commemorate this 150 mile walk that the women, children and elders were forced to make from the Lower Sioux to a prison camp at Fort Snelling. And this was in November over seven days. And, and so it was a time of great suffering. But um, that's when these women who didn't know how they were gonna feed their families, they didn't even know where they were being sent that's when they made that decision to protect those seeds, to hide them in the hems of their skirts. And so even when people were starving um, on that march, they protected those seeds. And that, and that to me was kind of an amazing act of courage and sacrifice. So that by thinking ahead to those future generations and even to that next season and making sure that you had seeds to plant um, to feed your families and your your children and your grandchildren, then th those women are the reason why we have that Dakota corn today. So um, that was the work of the organization. Part of the work was to grow that corn out and return it back to the communities. So I was so inspired by the story of those women because I thought, you know, today it's it's very a different world, but those seeds are still at risk from you know gene uh, genetically modified organisms, the GMOs. So that if I if I plant that Dakota corn, and my neighbor's GMO corn pollen blows over and cross pollinates my corn, I can be sued for stealing that patented material, which is just it's horrific. It's just horrific, and the the fact that this corn is actually much higher in nutrition. It's been adapted for, you know, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds of years to survive in this area. It, so it's a, it's a really beautiful plant that still has its, its original genetic material intact. So I just, it seemed to me that we have the same responsibility now to protect those seeds that the women did when they were sowing them in the hems of their skirts. So for me, being a gardener and a writer, the two things I can do, well, in a nonprofit um, director, I can, I can garden. So I do grow that corn in my backyard, not a lot, but um, just enough to keep seeds going and to share them. And then I can write a book that tells that story so that hopefully other people read it and, and make that connection back to seeds and understand what a beautiful relationship that is. Um, and and how we have a responsibility to those seeds to protect them. Wow. So now, so you grow some of that actual corn in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, mm -hmm. other people, so they can grow it as well. Yeah. yeah. That's really amazing. That's one of the that's one of the uh, dried ears that I have. Um, they're often more of a red and a cream. So yeah, getting ready to plant it. No, great. Um, I asked you when we we met a little a little early to chat with him. Mm -hmm. I asked if you would mind reading those two paragraphs that I you know just because I felt like they were mm -hmm. they kind of had the, a lot of the rivers of the story in those two paragraphs. And, and but one of the things you know listening to you talk that that really is so evocative is is her Rosalie's you know way of finding her way home after 28 years you know and just kind of instinctively heading in certain directions and then you you know and then as the book goes on and you you know you you find these moments in other people's stories you know where you where the where the the young girl is told to memorize where the where the cash is you know and if she, when she comes back she'll be able to find the seeds again and, and you just think oh god she's never going to come back how are they ever going to find those mm -hmm. you know, it just, mm -hmm. just so, so many beautiful threads but if you wouldn't mind just reading that um that would really 
make me happy. Yeah, and I I I, I really appreciate you um, selecting uh, these paragraphs to because they do speak really to uh, Rosalie's journey early on in the book when she is. Um, uh, just just to say a little bit about Rosalie, she's at that point. She's um, what is she around 40, 41, but she has been living on a farm um, for the past 22 years after spending six years as a foster child and having originally grown up on a Dakota reservation with her father for the first 12 years of her life. So then when her husband dies, um, she finds herself now drawn to go home and back to her childhood house to see if it's even there. And it's that it's that beginning of her journey, which is um, a big part of the book. And that in that journey, which she doesn't realize um, at the time, those seeds are part of that journey. They're, they are part of what are bringing her home, although she doesn't she doesn't know that in the beginning. So this, these two paragraphs are from uh, one of the first chapters where she's just come home to her childhood cabin. And you know, like all of us, that, that image of your childhood home is so large in your imagination, but when you get there, it's just an empty house. It's, so I'll just read now. <clears throat> A few light snowflakes began to drift in lazy swirls toward the ground. I could almost hear my father's voice asking, what's your plan, Rosie? Look around and see what you need to survive. I had imagined this moment too many times to leave now. I would stay the night and decide what to do in the morning. Stepping outside onto the porch, I filled a pail with snow to melt on the stove breathed sharp, clean air deep into my lungs, listened to the familiar hush of branches moving in the wind. Darkness settled into the woods, circling the cabin like a soft blanket. In the distance, a twig snapped. I was not afraid. I had not come here to escape the dark or the silence broken only by the rustle of dry leaves. But I had become a stranger to these woods. It would take time before this place knew me again. I felt its sorrow, the loss of generations who had lived here before me. The names of my family were like whispers just beyond hearing. I had returned too late. My family's stories had already disappeared. There was no one to keep their memory alive. At best, I hoped to make peace with my own past so I could move on, find a real home for myself, a place where I belonged. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's, I just think there's so much, so much of the whole book is, is, is in those two paragraphs. Uh, Nancy? Nancy? Nancy, do you want to unmute yourself for a second? Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> okay. I just you know, there's, a lot of chat, there's a lot of questions already, so maybe uh, we should. We, we I, I think um, perhaps we should put Diane and Barb's questions together. So Diane uh, Falk wanted to know um, how can the corn be grown so it's protected from cross pollination. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Barb wanted you to talk a little bit about how the corn that old can still germinate and be viable. Mm -hmm. Um, the, what, corn, the seed is, that's generations of descendants from that original corn, so it's not as old as um, what, I, what ha, it may have sounded like when I mentioned it. So it's hard to know exactly how old the seeds are um, when, they, uh, when they were grown out. But as long as you continue to grow them out periodically, they stay viable. They just diminish with each generation or each year. But there are amazing stories of seeds being discovered in old cash pits or caves and then being grown out after hundreds of years. So um, there's always hope. Um, the other question related to that is how can it be grown so it's protected from cross-pollination? So there's a couple ways you can do that. One is timing. 
So if you know when, so corn pollen can travel, they estimate three miles. So if you know when your neighbors within three miles are planting their corn, you can time your corn so that it will tassel at a different time. That's probably not feasible for as much corn as grows in Minnesota. And I, you know, am also surrounded by fields grow in a protected area so that if you have a windbreak um, around your around your garden, um, it might And we lost your sound there for a minute. Shoot. Diane, I don't know why we lost your sound. You're not muted. We just huh. cut out. There it is. I'm back? Yeah. Oh, unstable internet, you know, <laughs> rural areas. Right, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, I was saying that you, a windbreak will help stop pollen. And then the most labor intensive way is to use um, bags, to actually use uh, these little white paper envelopes over the ears just before they, um, they, the silks appear and then bag the pollen um, and then hand pollinate yourself. So we used to do this at the farm where I worked, we had youth programs and so we had teenagers and the great fun that we had as staff was telling these kids that, well, we would describe the white envelope for the ear. So this is a corn condom. <laughs> and you should have seen their faces. <laughs> oh, that was, you know, just part of our fun. Um, but anyways, that is how it's done. You collect the pollen you, and then you hand pollinate each ear. What I do, because I am I do have something of a windbreak, so it's a little bit protected area. I know that the colors of the corn I grow are rose, blue, and cream. So if any yellow shows up, I just I, I take them out. And that way I'm selecting, I'm selecting for good seeds. So, yeah, it's it's labor intensive work. Okay, so Larry wanted to know, um, and I don't think Larry is alone in this. Um, I don't. I was. I'd never heard of the 1862 mass hanging. Well, and Larry's wondering, is it because it was um, overshadowed by the Civil War, or just because our history is so whitewashed that? All of, yeah, all of the above. It really wasn't taught in even in Minnesota schools. Um, the, it's more that story was repressed. Um, but the 1862, and it occurred at the same time as the Civil War. So it was also overshadowed. And I would say some of the related um, issues may have been that the annuity payments were late coming to so the, the southern half of, of um, Minnesota was Dakota homeland, is Dakota homeland, but um, as more and more settlers moved in, then the Dakota were uh, negotiated and moved on to these very small reservations along the Minnesota River. And what that did was pretty much undercut the traditional foodways, which is um, at, at the heart of a of of culture really is the way that you grow and gather and cook and share your food. Um, and so, so living on that reservation, people were starving because the annuity goods were late, the payments were late. It was incredibly frustrating because they could no longer gather or hunt. Um, so many of the plants and animals had disappeared because of pressure from all the settlers moving in. And so in August of 1862, it just exploded one day. Um, it exploded into a six week war. And at the end of it, um, that's when 1700 women, children and elders were force marched 150 miles to Fort Snelling. And then that was in November. And then in the spring, they were put on flat boats and shipped to Crow Creek in South Dakota. And meanwhile, the men were sent to Iowa and then you know, no doubt you've heard about the, the hanging of the 38 in Mankato um, on December 26. So that's all part of the Dakota War. And that history was really repressed for um, many, many years in Minnesota. 
So it's something that it's still, it's still, people are still making an effort to come to terms with it um, in our state and, and, you know, to be, to have a, <clears throat> people go through a removal, then it means that you, it displaces families, it displaces your relationship to the land itself, to plants. And, and so the um, seed keeper is all about and come, what, how do you come back? How do you come home? How do you heal from that? Um, Catherine has two questions. Um, so we'll start with the first is, uh, why did you choose to create the Dakota Reservation in Minnesota? Was it to show how indigenous nations are surviving now with casinos and community centers and medical centers? Well, there, there are four Dakota reservations in Minnesota um, that are uh, so Upper Sioux, Lower Sioux, Prairie Island, and the Shakopee, Bidet, Walkentuan um, community. And I didn't want to center the book on a real reservation because then, you know, that raises all kinds of issues with um, where the line between real history and real, real people ends and fiction begins. So, but the fact that the, all the Dakota history is here, then I just made this more of a, um, a fictional reservation that, that shared the common history of that 1862 Dakota War, which is accurate to, in the book. Okay, and Catherine's second part of the question is, um, what do you think happened to Thomas at the end of the, at the, end of the novel? And, what did you want to happen? Did, did you have an idea of, of how he continued on? You know, that's such an interesting question because Thomas was one of the characters that, you know, he's he shows how young people can get um, kind of caught in the middle of, of these two very different cultural worldviews. And that Thomas being raised by, uh, his father who was white and a farmer, and then his mother who was Dakota and uh, you know more of a gardener, wild food gatherer. So very different worldviews about how you take care of the land. And so Thomas's path forward is going to be, he's gonna have to make that choice because he's been given um, insight and upbringing in both worlds. And, and so there's, there's um, uh, people talk about that who who have mixed upbringings as walking in two worlds, and so at some point it's and it can be stressful to navigate those two worlds at the same time. So Thomas will have to make the choice, but you know the fact that he's carrying those very very old seeds with him. You know I like to believe that those seeds are also going to bring Thomas home. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, okay, so Diane is wondering, when did the government finally stop taking children and sending them to the boarding schools? So the boarding schools were operating um, from about the 1880s until well into the 1940s or 50s. So a little different from each school, but the, it was in the 1930s when I think it was the Miriam report came out and really revealed just how horrific the conditions were and the um, all of the trauma that had been inflicted on children and their families. But you know, over the course of that 40 to 50 years, how many generations had already gone through there, had been separated from their families. So I read somewhere that there was an estimated 100,000 children who went through boarding schools. So a lot of what we deal with today in terms of um, the dysfunction in our communities has to do with what happened in boarding schools. So that's a long-term healing process. But for me, the work that I've done in these organizations around foods and gardening, that's one of the, that's one of the, the healing paths um, to, to uh, transform that trauma. So... It's, you know, to me, you always have to have hope. Right, right, right. When they, when these um, 
children had no parental models. It just yeah. goes down, down, down. Yeah, exactly. I mean, imagine any of us removed from your, um, one of my aunts was, she was four or five when she was sent to boarding schools and, and, you know, at least she had sisters, but um, there's so little to be away from their families for months at a time in, in what is an institution. Right, uh, right. Regimented. Yeah. I've read other accounts where they said they were just picking up the kids to take them to get, to take them to the doctor and the, and the children never come back. Yeah. Yeah, just horrible. Yeah. Um, okay, so Todd would like to know, leading into this, um, when you consider the historical treatment of your family, have you ever struggled with finding a place you can call home? And is that connected more to where you plant um, your, your seeds? Um, yes, the, um, the struggle of, of reconnecting with my own family's cultural identity has been part of my life's work, really. And, and, but it's difficult to figure out how to do that work. Like, where do you start? So I, I was watching a, um, oh, an interview on Channel 2 one afternoon, and they were talking to a Dakota historian um, named David Larson. And he was talking about the history and what had happened to Dakota people. And he said, when you know it was taken away, then you can reclaim it. And I had this big light bulb go off over my head because I realized, oh, that's what I have to do. Um, I can do the research. I can figure out, well, what, what was taken away? And then we do the work to reclaim it. So to me, that's what this food work is. You go back and you look at what the um, traditional diets look like. I mean, there was no type 2 diabetes um, back when people were living um, with a traditional diet of hunting, gathering wild foods, and then cultivating some foods like corn, squash, and beans. So no type 2 diabetes. And that's something that is now epidemic in Native communities. Well, really across the country, but epidemic in commu Native communities especially. So the, um, I started looking in my own life, where can I, where can I connect? What, what's my spiritual home that I can um, give back some of what was the privilege that I was born into, meaning a safe home, a stable environment, you know, a loving family. And so uh, that's why I made my commitment to um, writing books that help tell this story so that it's a way of, of helping people understand the history and then also working in nonprofits so that I can have a literal impact on community and families. So yeah, it's very much been um, part of my part of my journey as well. And part of my journey then is reflected in Rosalie's journey. Like I gave her my understanding of what it means to feel at the, you know, your family has come to this edge of assimilation. And then how do you, what brings you back? What what helps you come home to your to your, a place where you feel connected. And, you know, just as it was seeds for me, it is seeds for Rosalie. So I gave her that, that learning that I had gained from my work. Excellent. Well, okay, I, so kind of, I'm oh, thinking about, yeah, just, uh, but the way that you gave it to me was so um, slow and, tender and sometimes accidental and sometimes <laughs> infuriating and, and all of that gave it such power I thought that it was just really really beautiful and I just want to bring up one thing about Thomas because you know in that heartbreaking chapter let's see it must be chapter 17 where where his father kind of reasserts his himself on on Tommy's mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. and he stops gardening and he starts trying to please his father. Uh, you end that, that chapter with a, with a sentence or two sentences that then ring through the whole rest of the book with between and you say, because this is what he remembered, Thomas grew up believing that I had given up on him. Mm -hmm. That is what he can. Mm -hmm. And it's the way 
that's so beautifully because the child takes that isn't what Rosalie right. did. Right. The opposite of what Rosalie did. But right. in a child's mind, that's what it becomes. Yeah. And then his journey ever altered by that perception. Yeah, exactly. Heartbreaking. So heartbreaking. Um, okay, Nancy, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Um, so uh, Allison, who is also, also an author, would like to um, hear a little bit more about the, the author process. Um, so how, how this story emerged for you and, and how you worked at it, how it changed you. Um, was there any part of it that you struggled with? And did anything surprise you as you were writing this book? Yeah, great questions. Um, so I started it about 10 years ago. And I, about the time, or not long, well, I started thinking about it 10 years ago. And I'm, I have a very slow process. Plus, you know, we all have those distractions in our lives. So I started thinking about it. And, and, um, and then one day I sat down and wrote the story where Rosalie has just come to the cabin. And she realizes that she's got nothing. You know, she's lost her, her father, who is her only family. She's lost her husband. She doesn't feel like the farm was ever her home. Um, she has, in, you know, she has nothing. And, it, and that's where the book began, was her at that point. And, and the interesting thing in looking back was um, then I could use that and ask questions about, well, then how did she, you know, how did she get there? What was her life like before that? And then I would kind of write backwards in time. And then I would think, well, then what would happen next? And then I'd write forwards in time. And so it really emerged kind of like, um, kind of like an onion, you know, adding layers around it and it just grew. So it grew outward. It didn't grow in a, in a line at all. <clears throat> and then, it was all going to be told by Rosalie. I had her as the narrator, but then Darlene started to um, express thoughts. <laughs> and then I had, uh, there was a period of time where I <clears throat> was away from the book for about a year. And so to get back into it, I started a writing exercise where I just would um, sit down with a notebook and do free writing where I would, I would write the, the character's name on the top of the page, and then I would write, tell me your story, I'm listening. And then I would just free write, and then it's like, wow, these people are showing up, and they've got stories to tell. I, I didn't realize, being a nonfiction writer, that that stuff happened. <laughs> so, so then the book started to shape that way. Those characters started picking up different pieces of the story, and then, um, you know, so so that was my process was just to keep adding pieces to it. And then I have a thing where I have a, I have a big table behind me and I take recipe cards and I color code them to each character. And then I lay them out so I can see the juxtaposition of it. So there's a visual element to how the book emerges. Um, and I would say what I struggled with was how you know, I was thinking, so I came into this having written a memoir and a book of nonfiction. In the memoir, I thought, well, that, you know, you pretty much put your whole life and your family's story out there. So, you know, you've, you've, that's, that's a very vulnerable process. But what I didn't realize about fiction is that it's, while it's not your factual story, you're kind of putting your whole self out there because it's all you. Everything that you've created comes out of your imagination. And that was hugely vulnerable and I did not expect that. So that was, um, I had to, you know, I had to work, I had to work through that uh, for a while. And then there's all the fear and anxiety that just comes with writing, period. If you know, all you writers out there, you must, you must know that. <laughs> you must be familiar with constant anxiety, the editor on your shoulder, doubting everything. <coughs> and um, how it changed me was, um, it was kind of a gamble, you know, to go from nonfiction to fiction. And, you know, there's, there's, it, it paid off is what surprised me. Like I found out 
oh, maybe I can tell a story. Maybe I can tell a fictional story and maybe I can create characters. This was all unknown to me when I started the book. So um, it, it was really a wonderful process in being able to work with language the way you can in fiction that you don't um, have that kind of freedom so much in nonfiction. That was the big joy to me was the, the language. So I, I didn't tell you that Allison is also a professor. And so she says, I love this. Writing is never linear. Love asking the characters what they had to say, as well as the onion imagery. So I think you got an A for the day. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'm wondering, are these characters still speaking to you? Are they still talking to you? And Well, you know that Thomas character, um, I'm just, I'm now carrying the thought about, well, what if there was a next book about the two young men, Thomas and Mato? Because um, I really am interested to see where, as young people with a very different upbringing, where would they go? Where would they take this? Um, so kind of, kind of mulling on that one for a while. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> uh, Catherine was wondering, um, what role did storytelling um, play in your childhood and your growing up? Well, I was a huge reader of everything, especially comic books and fairy tales. So um, the, my, my mother was really quiet. So she was kind of the, she was the reverse where when I was writing the memoir, I, I couldn't, she didn't really have stories to tell me, but I could go out and gather stories and bring them back. And then she would give me feedback on them. She would tell me if I got it right. So, um, so she, in a way, her inability to tell stories drew out my innate ability to write stories. So, um, um, and then the work, you know, working over the past 20 years with elders at these organizations and then hearing their stories and, you know, kind of being a more immersed in, a, in an environment and a culture where storytelling is so important and so much information is communicated through stories. Um, so I feel like, I feel like I understand the power of stories much more deeply. Yeah. Um, and this right. may be a generalization, Go but ahead. I feel like um, that native culture just is more, so much more willing to listen to the, the elders stories than mm -hmm. I, I've, this, I feel like sometimes people are just kind of warehoused at at nursing homes and, and their stories aren't being told. Do you feel like it's part of the culture is that? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I don't know if, do any of you know Ella Cara Deloria of her work? She wrote Water Lily. Um, she was a, she was a um, anthropologist and did a lot of, wrote books with friends, Boaz, uh, preserving the Dakota Lakota language. And I, um, so she preserved many of the very old traditional stories that actually served a very concrete purpose in the culture from passing down values, uh, preserving the history, entertaining, keeping you know your family stories, documenting what happened each year. And so stories were um, a really significant part of the culture. It was ways, you know, one of the ways that you would um, teach your children too. You tell them a story and there's all these teachings and metaphors in these stories. And then there are stories that are mythical and then there are stories that are based on history. And then, um, and then there's people like me who are writing contemporary stories. And I think of the work that we do as really uh, kind of a, almost like a checkpoint of how are we doing in our in our lives and in our culture um, and in our communities compared to the teachings that were handed down in the traditional stories about the ways that we're supposed to live as human beings. 
So that's why the book opens with a poem from the seeds, because they're reminding us we have a responsibility and, you know, it's, it's troubled. It's in trouble, that relationship. So the storytelling, I, you know, I think storytelling is really important to a lot of cultures and that what happens nowadays, you know, we have all the, we have Zoom, <laughs> we have TV, we have all these um, electronic forms of storytelling and it's a distraction to the kind of listening skills that you need to, to actually listen to a storyteller. Agreed. Before we get to Cheryl's question, can I ask one thing more about, the, because this, this, there's a voice in, in this book, um, and it's, she's a good storyteller, she has a strong story to tell, and it's uh, Gabby. Could you, could you talk a little bit about Gabby? Because I love the way that, that she and Rosalie, you know, for, I love the way their friendship hangs in there through so many periods of upheaval. But they're, and they're so different. Uh, and which Gabby lets us in on right at the beginning where, you know, one is a talker and one is a listener. But it's just, uh, but I just think, uh, I just loved her. And I, and I thought her voice was so essential to get so many of the, of, of the, of the sort of themes in. But Rosalie really couldn't have taken it. Right. You know, I mean, it, it, it totally, it would have felt very um, arbitrary if, if mm -hmm. Rosalie you know, was, was, a, was a Gabby type character, mm -hmm. <laughs> given how she mm -hmm. lived. Could you talk a little bit about who she is and where she, how she came into the book? Yeah, um, and you're right. By having those different voices, I was really able to bring in different perspectives. And what, um, one of the things I'm, I really am interested in is women's friendships, the way that we can support each other across huge life changes um, across, you know, many years and then even absences and then pick up where we left off. And that those, those, um, those relationships, those friendships can be as close as sisters or even closer sometimes. So um, Gabby for me was a bit of a combination of two women that I, that I met on that Dakota commemorative march who were um, two of the leaders of it and that very strong outspoken leadership that Native women can demonstrate in their communities and the very powerful role that they've that they've always played in passing on culture, raising children, but then also making sure that the community survived. So Gabby was um, a contemporary version of that but because she came out of dysfunction, she had to find her path. She also had to push through trauma and then, and then you know, had her own experience with what happens when you're doing this activist work and how, how um, frustrating and how draining it can be. And what happens when you trade off your own life and your family's life to do this work out in the world. So, because these are difficult, they're difficult decisions and choices to make about how do you do the work. You know, um, that was one of the things I was trying to just reflect on without, you know, I didn't want this book to be um, uh, preaching. I, I wanted to just to raise questions like, like uh, the different paths you can take to, to try to have this relationship with the world around you, with the earth, with the water. And, you know, there's different paths that you can go, but each one has trade-offs. And, and then, you know, and where do those, those paths take you? And it's kind of a, a theme, it's a bigger theme throughout the book about our relationship with seeds has changed greatly from that that time in 1862 when the women were protecting them um, at all costs. And then we look at today and then what, so what does that change in relationship mean to us as human beings? What does it mean to the seeds? So it's just, Gabby was a way to um, really reflect on a different path in the world and what that would mean. 
Mm, well, great. leading into that, um, Cheryl was wondering if you um, wanted to talk about some of the nonprofits profits that you work with. Oh, sure. Well, Dream of Wild Health was uh, and is this phenomenal uh, native-led nonprofit located in Hugo. And it's now, um, when I started, it was a tiny little half-acre garden that was actually leased. And now it's a 30-acre farm in Hugo. So they, um, they grow out and uh, restore these indigenous seeds back to communities. They bring um, native youth up from the cities and teach them how to grow and to cook. And they give them jobs working at the farmer's market. They have a CSA. So they do phenomenal work. I just, I love Dream of Wild Health. Um, so I was there for 11 years and then I left there in 2019 and moved to another organization called the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. And that's a, a national coalition of um, uh, tribes around the country who are all doing this work of rebuilding their food systems, um, you know, getting back to these old seeds, gathering plants, um, you know, learning to grow their own food again. And, and so it's just, it's such beautiful work. And I think for everybody, this, you know, the act of reconnecting with our food through gardens, through farmers markets, through just knowing where it comes from, um, is a really important part of just being human. So um, I love having the nonprofit work as a place to feel like I can also make an impact, a direct impact on communities that way. And in the back of the book, I list them, I list both of them in case you're interested in just knowing more about how this work is, is being um, implemented out in the world. It's fantastic. Yeah, I think the whole farm to table movements and, and people just being more conscious of recycling and not killing the planet, even though it seems like we're moving pretty slowly um, to fixing our past sins. But um, James, do you want to have any final thoughts with Diane or any other questions you want to do? Well, I was looking at Todd has a, well, first of all, I love that Larry's, Larry has a favorite quote which is at the end of, or at the top of page 19. Mm -hmm. um, Diane, do you want to, want to read that, that little? Um, okay. <clears throat> My father believed in the power of stories. Books were weapons that could be used against you unless you armed yourself with knowledge. Yeah, yeah so true. Yeah. That should go up in a bookstore. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe it. Larry, Larry is our sage from the universe. So we try to listen to five words. <laughs> James, can I, can I just say we have, I know we're running out of time, but I can't, I just want to say how much I enjoyed the book. The bookstore had trouble getting the copies and I was worried I wouldn't get it done, but it was such a wonderful experience reading the book. And I was shocked when I realized that it was 50 years ago that I read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee when I was like 17 years old. And that led me as a middle school teacher to teach a novel called Only Earth and Sky Last Forever by Nathaniel Benchley, who's the father of Peter Benchley wrote Jaws, but Nathaniel's the much better writer. And it's about a fictional uh, teenager who ends up with Crazy Horse at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Um, and I taught it to eighth graders for years. And uh, this really, brought back a lot of wonderful memories. And I can't believe this is your first novel because of the way you uh, interspersed the characters and their point of view. It really was a, a fantastic book. So I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I just had to say that. Thank you. You don't need to apologize when you're saying nice things. <laughs> I'm going to make um, a little collection on our website 
of other books that uh, people might want to look into after reading The Seed Keeper. We have some wonderful children's books too. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll add Larry's to that as well. So um, I'll, put, I'll put that up and if people are interested in, in learning more or another perspective, um, they can check that out. Todd, do you wanna just ask your question directly or? Let's see, am I on? Yes. It, you know, as a, as a previous organic farmer mm -hmm. and coming from a family of agriculture, there were many things in the book that we share a legacy of, including the youngest uh, child in my grandmother's family who was adopted, but nobody ever talked about where she came from or, or that she was simply a Native American. But we're always challenged by the balance of personal profit versus shared legacy. And we've seen how bad that can get when so few profit and so many work for next to nothing. And, and I think that's where maybe we can find common ground on how we address these social issues of where it's so unfair. Mm -hmm. why, why can't a, a, a seed be patented that is not altered? And if corporations alter it, they are sued out of existence. And now that Monsanto is gone, you know, you've got that issue to the sideline. But there's so many other things that we've done to damage the environment, which is, if I understand First Nations correctly, this is where we all share the same resources, but we never own them. We respect them and we leave legacy if we treat them correctly. So I just, you know, your book speaks to this over and over again, but I just wonder if you have any closing thoughts on, mm -hmm. on any of that. that. That's a great closing thought. Um, there's actually a saying in Dakota, which is a language I'm now relearning or learning, I should say. Um, <clears throat> and it's mitakuye owasi, mitakuye owasi. And it means we are all related. And that sums up a philosophy that's at the heart of um, indigenous thinking. We are all relatives. So not only all of us here on this call, but we are related to the animals, the plants, the insects, the air, the water, every being on this earth. And contrary to the way human beings think of themselves as entitled to everything, we're actually the lowest species because we're the one that is the most dependent on everyone else. So if you go into your relationship with um, the plants outside your window, for example, and you see them as relatives, as opposed to something you own and can dispose of, how do you treat that relative in a way that is uh, respectful? And then, and, th and that just shifts everything. When you think of, of everything around you as a relative, you come to it with that same respect you would treat your mother and your father and your children. Then um, it, it takes the relationship out of that profit world that, that um, Todd was speaking of. And that uh, to me is where the biggest shift needs to happen is to begin to feel that connection and, and a sense of humility that we're dependent on this earth. Mm -hmm. And we have, to, we have to leave that legacy for our children and grandchildren. That's our work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, this has been, a, it's been a wonderful hour and it's a wonderful book. And I think you as a number of people have expressed, I think you should, we're encouraging you to explore the story. <laughs> all right, duly noted. <laughs> and thank you all for the invitation to come and have this conversation. I just love the opportunity to hear your questions and your thoughts. And, you know, this is one of the ways I find out what did I write <laughs> by hearing back from readers. Okay. This was wonderful. And, and Diane's um, publishing company is Milkweed, which is in the in the Twin Cities and is one of our favorite um, small publishers. And I just want to say thank you to Todd for reading this book 
and reaching out to um, Johanna, who is Diane's um, PR person, mm -hmm. and getting this set up. So it, it was just wonderful to have Diane with us tonight, and and just added such a rich experience um, to our to our usual book club. And I also wanted to say thank you. We have a lot of new people that haven't been in book club before, so I hope that you'll come back again next month and um, and, and just thank you for joining us. And and um, I'll post this on our YouTube channel. And um, our next book club is June 16th with Brian Christie um, in the Company of Killers. But just a reminder that, that Brian's going to be with us on May 26th as well, um, maybe to talk more about his work. Um, Outside and and then we'll kind of focus on the book on the on the 16th of June. So May 26th with James, they're going to do a conversation. Diane, you'd probably be fascinated by by Brian Christie. Um, he worked for National Geographic for many years, and and um, he, he sounds like a spy or something because he has this really fascinating varied life. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think you and he, and he would have a lot of interesting things mm -hmm. to talk about. <laughs> uh, but again, thank you. Thank you all so much yeah. for joining us. Thank you so much, Diane. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.